please join in the responsive call to worship. How priceless is your love, O God. Your people take refuge under the shadow of your wings. For with you is the well of life. And in your life is your life. Bless the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Please be seated. Today's call to confession and assurance of pardon are drawn from something we sort of studied in the uh, confirmation class this morning, from a declaration of faith that was largely written by uh, Dr. Uh, Shirley Guthrie at Columbia Seminary. We recognize in Jesus what God created us to be. He exposes our failures to live as he lived. He demonstrates the new humanity that God promises to give us through him. And so in the assurance of faith and of God's grace, let us pray together our prayer of confession. Lord, you intend that we live fully, yet we are reluctant to open our hands to receive your abundance. We prefer to do things for ourselves and to trust that we know what is best. Pursuing our own desires, we have turned from you, and still we wonder why we feel empty. Forgive our sins. Fill us again. 
May your grace spill over into our lives so that we may gratefully accept what you offer and live thankfully in the manner of Jesus. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting our sins against us. Each of us beholds on the cross the Savior who died in our place, so that we may no longer live for ourselves, but for him. In him is our only hope for salvation. Forgiven by God and supported by our brothers and sisters, we strive to become more faithful and effective in our daily practice of the Christian life. be seated. In the name of Jesus Christ, welcome to this time of worship this day as we gather together as a family of faith at First Presbyterian Church. Members and visitors alike, we hope you'll sign the friendship pad so we can have a record of you being here with us today. On the back of the bulletin, you'll see various announcements. I'll highlight a couple. One is there's a very important meeting right after church today uh, in in. Uh, it'll be up in the stock building, either in the Ed Greer class or in the senior high room that has to do with parents of young people who have signed up for the ski retreat, which is uh, planned for next weekend. So if you have a child uh, planning to go on that ski retreat, please gather on the second floor of the stock building right after the service today. And tomorrow morning, or tomorrow, our uh, church offices are closed in recognition of the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. I will encourage you to consider, you've seen it in the uh, first press and perhaps talked about it among yourselves. For some of you, it's become a tradition, the all-church retreat to Montreat. If you've not yet decided to go, I hope you will. It's a wonderful retreat. One of my very best friends in the world is going to be the speaker. Uh, his name is George Anderson, a, a, an illustrious name around here. This is the other George Anderson. Uh, but it, it'll be a wonderful retreat. He's a fine uh, teacher and preacher, but Montreat is mostly about being there and being with the church family, getting to know one another in a uh, wonderful setting. So uh, the de it's not too late to sign up, but I hope you will we'll soon because the deadline is fast approaching. We've got a lot to do this morning. It's a busy morning. Uh, one of the most significant things we do is to celebrate the sacrament of baptism with a, uh, a family who has deep roots here in this church. And at this time, I'm going to ask uh, Preston and Candace Worth Harris to come join us in the front of the church. And uh, alongside them, an elder, uh, father, and grandfather playing all those roles here this morning. It is a special joy when a child of the church returns to the church to bring a child to be baptized. Hey, you smiled at me. Well, you... <laughs> Candace uh, grew up as a part of this church family, and many of you who know the journey that she has been on is now a Presbyterian pastor down at the beach. And, uh, uh, in addition to uh, uh, fulfilling a wonderful ministry down there, 
she met Preston, and uh, they are now married, and, uh, and look what's happened. Um, and, th and now we get to share in their joy. And not just we share in the joy, we, this is one of those reminders that we are truly a connectional system. Technically, you perhaps know that the ideal thing is for babies to be baptized in the churches where they will be raised, so that the people making promises for them are the very ones to keep those promises. In a sense, we are making promises on behalf of the church families uh, that will raise her. Specifically, the session of the Plymouth Presbyterian Church has extended this invitation for us to do this baptism but they will get the, be the beneficiaries. They'll be the ones to see this little girl grow up. And so many of the members of that uh, uh, Plymouth Church are here today um, as a part of the extended family. And so this is a, truly a reminder that uh, we do often raise the children uh, from other churches, but they are all together with us in the body of Christ. This is a significant day then for you, the two of you, and your extended family, and wider church families, a day of great celebration. And you're smiling, so you must be happy about all this, <laughs> because we are. There will come a day when we'll have some questions for her, but not today. Today, those questions come to you as uh, her parents. And so the questions I have, Preston and Candace, for the two of you are these. Do you take this day to reaffirm your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. And do you claim Christ's covenant promises not just for yourselves now, but also for your daughter? Yes. Do you promise to pray for her, to love her, to teach her, so that she grows up knowing that she is a child of God? Yes. And do you look forward to the day when she will stand before a community of believers and profess her own faith in Jesus Christ? Elder David Worth now has a question for the congregation. Come to my seat. Our Lord Jesus Christ ordered us to teach those who are baptized. Do you, the people of this church and the churches of Plymouth and Swan Corner who are present here, promise to tell this new disciple, Virginia Greer Harris, the good news of the gospel, to help her know all that Christ commands, and by your fellowship, to strengthen her family ties with the household of God? If this is your promise, please say, we do. We do. Let us pray. Lord God of grace and goodness, we give thanks for this good day, for the gift you've given us, for the gift this child represents. We pray your blessing upon parents and grandparents, extended family, church family, that all who take a part in raising her will be guided by your spirit. As I have received her into my arms, we Remember that she belongs to you, and we give you thanks for your faithful love to her. As we baptize now with water, we pray that you would baptize with Holy Spirit. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Virginia Greer Harris, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I feel a particular connection with this child because we're in the same fraternity, or sorority, however you like to say it. She's a preacher's kid, <laughs> and I am too. Some people think being a preacher's kid must be one of the worst things in the world constantly under scrutiny, expected to be the best behaved kid around, which let me tell you, Greer, doesn't always happen that way. <laughs> but some of us as preacher's kids have discovered that it's a wonderful life because in addition to your own parents and grandparents, you've got a church family that thinks you're awfully special. And now you have at least three church families who think that about you. And so my hope for you, and you won't remember any of this, my hope for you is that you love being a preacher's kid and that the church for you is your extended family and that it's a place of joy and nurture all of your days. Let us pray. Gracious God, 
We give you thanks for your goodness to us. We give you thanks for the promise of baptism, that we belong not to ourselves but to you. Continue to support and sustain these parents as they receive this sacred trust and offer you their best selves. Continue to bless us and keep us now and always through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let us sing. Hey, sweetie. And now, what is actually a very good segue, we'll have a moment for mission uh, from our foundation. Good morning. My name is Rob Fields, and I'm here on behalf of the found First Presbyterian Church Foundation. When I hear the word foundation, immediately my mind goes to the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Obviously, I listen to NPR radio on the way to work in the morning. But if you look, there are 27 of the largest foundations in the world, in U.S. and uh, Europe, have over $150 billion in assets, which are dedicated to, for the most part, doing good in this world. Wouldn't it be neat to have your own foundation? I mean, wouldn't it sound really good, the Fields Family Trust, or the Sheila S. Barrick Family Trust, or maybe the Inskeep Charitable Trust. In 1991, the great-grandfather of Virginia Greer Harris, the father of David Worth, faced that question, wouldn't it be neat to have a family foundation? And his decision was to give $5,000 to First Presbyterian Church to start the First Presbyterian Church Foundation of Raleigh. Sixteen years later, it is our foundation. It is the foundation for all of us. And I'm here to report that the foundation is in good shape. It has grown. It has over $1 million in assets and over $600,000 have been given away in those 16 years to such things as our most recent capital campaign, to Peace College, to Union Theological Seminary, and to the Child Development Center, which was started here at First Presbyterian Church. And the foundation is set up so that the principle is preserved. It is not invaded. Only the earnings are given away. So a gift to the foundation is truly a gift forever. This year, your foundation has reflected on what does it mean to say forever? What does forever mean? And there are examples all around us, but one that struck a chord with us and that we have grabbed hold of was that 190 years ago, 190 and 51, 190 years and 51 weeks ago, Dr. McFeeters and 40 other adults and children gathered across the street to organize First Presbyterian Church of Raleigh. 92 years later in 1908, First Presbyterian Church was the only Presbyterian church in Wake County. And Dr. White set out with members of the Vanguard class to do something about that. And today, there are 25 churches in Wake County. Now, I don't know what the people who gathered 190 years and 51 weeks ago thought, but I suspect they were looking and planning for forever. As we approach our 191st birthday next Sunday, January 21st, 
1st, 2007. We challenge the congregation to remember your foundation. It is your foundation. Consider a gift to the foundation this week of a dollar and 91 cents or $19.01 or $191, something with the numbers one, nine, and one. And next Sunday, come and join your foundation for a reception to celebrate the 191st birthday. There will be a reception between the services and at that reception there will be a gift from the foundation to the church unveiled. Now, so you'll know what our plan is. We're going to start small, and the, and, and, and the gift is, is going to be something that, while it's significant, is not going to be a significant cost to the foundation to give it. But we are working towards the 200th year birthday. And at the 200th year birthday, it is our hope that with your help, your foundation will give a substantial gift to the work of Jesus Christ in Wake County. Thank you for all of the support that you've given. And as I close, let us remember the words of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, which is our true foundation. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. We have another special moment here now to the recognition of some folks who have served us well and Candy Parks representing the nominating committee from the most recent nominating committee to make this uh, presentation. Candy. As moderator of the 2006 Church Officer Nominating Committee, it gives me great pleasure to present to the congregation three of our members who, by unanimous approval of our committee and of the session, have been named Elder Emeritus at First Presbyterian Church. Each of these members has met the criteria having reached the age of 70 and served at least three terms as a deacon or elder or both. They have all served in many other capacities as well during their years of membership. We do not view this honor as a symbol of their retirement from participation in the life of the church, but rather as another step in their faith journey. We expect that First Presbyterian Church will be the beneficiary of their time and talents for many years to come. Our church is blessed to have them among us and we will treasure their commitments of love and service as they continue to honor the one whom we all serve, Jesus the Christ, the head of the church. As I call their names, I would ask them to come forward and receive their plaque of recognition from Dr. McLeod. Hilda H. Patterson. John W. Person. William L. Williams. On behalf of a grateful congregation for faithful service. God be with each one of you. And they use the words a small token. This is a small token. It's a very small plaque. But behind this plaque are uh, a great deal of affection and thanks for what you have offered and, to echo what Candy said, will offer. Um, this is just a way of to, say, to say thank you and to give you this word of commendation for the way you have faithfully served First Presbyterian Church. God bless you and all those who love you. Thank you. Sometimes it's easier to preach. You have one thing to keep up with, and I'm, um, 
I have to keep consulting the bulletin so as not to get lost. Uh, the time has now come to share some joys and concerns of our church family before we pray together. Just to let you know that uh, Sheila's dad, Howard Spruill, is still at Wake Med Rehab making some progress there. We're grateful for that. A child has been born to our congregation, Finn Anderson Stillwell, the son of Kent and Allie Stillwell, born on the 8th. Uh, you'll be glad to know that Amy Veach came through her surgery on Thursday uh, well. Uh, preliminary reports uh, show some good signs. She now needs to uh, heal from this surgery before she can begin her chemotherapy. Keep her and her family and the young people of our church with whom she works in your prayers. And many of you probably have heard the news by now, but one of the longtime members of this church who was so involved with early birds and cornelia class and others, Hubert Altman died this morning, uh, very early this morning. We don't know any funeral arrangements yet. We will soon. Uh, but uh, check with the church office or uh, the newspapers. Uh, but keep Carolyn and their extended family in your prayers. This is obviously a very difficult time. As God's people, let us now join together in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, bless us with your presence as we gather here this day, for we are here for a sacred purpose, to worship and to serve and to praise. Bless us with your presence and then equip us to be your faithful people that we might leave this place as your disciples going out into the world. For your covenant promises to us and to those we love, we give you thanks for this day. You have given us all things. Give us one thing more. Give us hearts overflowing with gratitude. Help us be a blessing to your world that we might know the joy of our salvation, the joy that is your gift to us. God of grace, we pray your blessing on those whose lives have been touched by chaos or cruelty or death or destruction. Strengthen the weak, give courage to the fearful, give hope to the downcast. Reveal yourself to those who have given up on faith. Reveal yourself that belief and hope might be rekindled, providing strength for the journey. Eternal God, this day we pray your blessing on those persons who will go from here as missionaries to New Orleans to serve you there as we continue the effort to rebuild hope. Surround them with your care, use them in a mighty way, keep them safe and return them to us that in their witness, you might help us to be an even more faithful church. Give us a vision for ministry in this place, a passion for ministry, that in all we do, your name might be glorified in all the earth, now and forevermore, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us when we prayed together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This time I invite the children to come down front if you'd like to see what I've got in the doggy bag. So here's a doggy bag, eh? We are marching steadily toward the sermon. So as the children march forward. Did, did you see, I'm going to show you what's in the bag, but I, we're going to look at something else first. Did you see the leaders that were up here just a minute ago? Mr. Williams, and Mrs. Patterson, and there was a person named Mr. Person. You see all those people? Do they look like leaders? 
We're going to see some more people later. So 21 people are going to come up here, and each one of them got a call from uh, Mrs. Parks who said, the church nominating committee has looked over everybody in the church, and we decided that you are a person of faith, you have great gifts, and we would like you to lead our church for the next three years. What do you think the person said if you got a phone call like that? What would you say if she said, I want you to be a leader? Would you say, oh boy, I'm glad you called. I'll do that. What do you think people say? Okay, that's the answer she was hoping for, yeah, okay. <laughs> but you know what most people said? said, who, me? Oh, I don't know if I can do that if I'm good enough to be a leader. That's what most people say. They, and so then the, Miss Parks said, well, you pray about it, talk to your family and see if God is calling you to be a leader of the church. But you know how I knew that they probably were kind of reluctant to do that? Because that's what people in the Bible did. Do you remember what happened when God called Moses? In Exodus, God tells Moses he wants him to go lead the Israelites out of slavery. But Moses says, oh, Lord, I've never been a good speaker. I can't make speeches and stuff. I can't do that. And the Bible, it says, Moses said, I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. What would it sound like to be slow of tongue? Well, how would it sound? <laughs> it would sound like, oh, what? That would be pretty good. Okay. <laughs> but God says, well, who gave you the ability to speak? It is God who does that. I'll help you. But you know what Moses does? He whines some more. Can you whine? Oh, my God, really? Please send someone else. That's what Moses said. So you know what happened? God gets a little irritated with Moses. And he, God finally says, well, what about your brother Aaron? He's a good talker. He used to be a DJ. Tell you what. <laughs> you tell him what to say, and he'll tell the people what, what you said. So that was one way. So God sent Moses and his brother Aaron. What about, do you know what a prophet is? What's a prophet? Somebody who tells people about Jesus. That's a pretty good answer. It's someone who speaks for God. And so God called Isaiah. He said, I'd like you to speak for me. And that picture, the second one from the, on the window on the left, Isaiah says, oh, but God, I can't do that. I'm a person of unclean lips. And so in that picture, you can see there's sort of an angel holding a coal, a hot coal, and that cleanses his lips. And uh, that burned away his symbol. And then, once Isaiah knew that God had prepared him, Isaiah said, send me, I can do it. One more real quick one, Paul. You know, we read from his letters, the Apostle Paul, every Sunday. But you know what they said about that great preacher and teacher, Paul? They said, he isn't a very good speaker. And his words aren't very impressive. So we can see in the Bible that God doesn't pick people who look perfect. God picks people like you and me and helps us learn to be leaders. Now, I would like you to look in here and see if you see a picture of a leader. Would you pull that out and look in there and see what you see? This is a picture of a future leader of this very church, maybe. Who do you see in there? Who do you see? See yourself? Who do you see? See future leaders of this church. So someday you may get that call from Mrs. Parks, or her daughter, and, <laughs> and say, we want you to be a leader of the church, and someday I may be following you, because I know God will help you do it. So keep learning about what God wants you to do. And would you say with me a prayer, I'll say it, and then you say it? Let us bow our heads and pray. Great God, thank you for calling. Good people to be our leaders. Help us to be good followers as we learn how to be leaders, too. Thank you. Amen. Those of you can lead the young ones to Children's Church, and the rest of you can go back to your, your families. Let us pray. 
God, your light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has never quenched it. Illumine our minds that we might understand what we read and what we hear as preached. In Christ's name we pray, amen. The scripture this morning is taken from uh, Paul's instructions, continued instructions to the uh, Corinthian Christians in chapter 12, first 11 verses. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. The word of the Lord. We continue with our scripture reading for today, reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Hear now God's word to us. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called to the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine, after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The word of God. God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Life is full of many transforming moments, events or people who have a marked influence on our lives and change its course or direction. Such events as marriage, the birth of children, divorce, career moves, serious illnesses or accidents, death of a loved one, etc., all fall into this category. Sometimes we even divide our lives according to this, saying things like, well, when I was single or since I got married or before kids and after kids, we talk about our lives before and after cancer or some other (coughs) illness or before and after a flood or a hurricane. When I look back at my own life, it has its transforming times. And actually, after 30 years of marriage, it's hard for me to remember too much about before marriage. That's a transforming moment in all of our lives. 
Yet, our lives are the sum total of all of our experiences, both positive and negative. And they influence us in the choices we make and in the lives that we lead. Our text today is about one such life-changing experience, a wedding. It's a common experience for most of the guests, but a transforming one for the bride and the groom and to a certain extent, their families. Weddings were big social occasions in Jesus' time, and to run out of food or drink would be a disgrace to the family. Yet even today, a family's prominence is sometimes judged by the location and the extravagance of a wedding reception. Was there a band, a seated meal? Was there wine to toast the happy couple? Certainly, this event is the most costly of the wedding and receives a lot of thought and preparation. Still, it seems a strange beginning for John's gospel and an odd choice for the location of Jesus' first miracle or sign. But this is what we have, so let's see what we can learn from it. We know that Jesus attended the wedding with his disciples and that his mother was there. He was not opposed to celebrations and having fun, and I like that about him. Some believe that it could have been a wedding of a relative since Mary is concerned with matters of the reception and in particular running out of wine. Jesus is reluctant to get involved, not yet ready to reveal his power and his identity. Yet he does get involved in a kind of behind-the-scenes way, changing water into wine. The symbolism of the water is important here. There was a great deal of it, some 120 to 130 gallons of water. We might wonder what all that much water was doing there. Our text says that it was for the Jewish rite of purification. This ritual is strictly regulated within the Torah. It was a symbolic act in preparation for worship, but the amounts here are extravagant. It would only take one cup of water to purify a hundred men. There is enough water here to purify the whole world. Now think about that. Jesus comes into ordinary lives, offering us the opportunity to be purified and to make ourselves right with God. This miracle or sign is different from most that Jesus performed. In this case, hardly anyone even knows that a miracle has taken place. Our text says that Jesus performed the first sign in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and that his disciples believed in him. Milton Schwarzentruber writes, the meaning I prefer to draw from this passage is that the work of Jesus and the gospel often occurs deep in the recesses of the human heart and life and is not ob necessarily obvious to all the onlookers. Only those who take the trouble to taste the life of the person will notice the difference, the transformation that has taken place. There are many Christians who themselves would be hard pressed to identify a precise time or a place when the water of their lives was turned into wine. Nor is the transformation always as sudden or as complete as it is in this text. But that does not make it less real or intoxicating. Jesus' concern and involvement here shows that he cares about the everyday events of our lives, things that are important to us. Often we call on him in the big times in life when our need is the greatest and we forget to include him in the normal, ordinary routine of our lives. The transforming moment in our text is referred to a wonder or a sign. And I like that term, sign. A sign is something that points towards something, that shows us the way and keeps us from getting lost. In this case, a wondrous deed points to Christ's glory, yet not all saw the sign and came to believe. An ordinary wedding party was transformed into an occasion of revelation, a moment when some were brought closer to God. I believe that God's signs are all around us. We just don't see them or we don't interpret them as the work of God. Our interpretation has a great deal to do with our acceptance and our belief. Often we are too logical we try to explain everything. Our senses are dull to the beauty in the world about us and to God's extraordinary involvement in our lives. 
But when you think about it, isn't it incredible how God brings two people together and blesses their union and life together? Isn't it a miracle to witness the birth of a child and to hold that tiny little hand in ours? And isn't it incredible how God can take the hurts in life and turn them around, using them for good? Even in the midst of illness, we can find the peace of God and the courage to face the challenges. Even in death and loss, we can feel Christ's presence very close to us, sharing our sorrow and pain. These are the transforming moments of life, and we thank God for them. I experienced one of those transforming moments on Christmas Eve. It's always a hectic time for any minister. There are lots of services and responsibilities in the church, and we love and enjoy them and want them to be special. But then there's the family there, too, and their needs and our responsibilities towards them. This year, my dad was in the hospital, at that time in Goldsboro. My colleague Amy was facing serious surgery, and my longtime friend and mentor of 30 years, Wiley Smith, was dying of cancer. Wiley and I had seen each other through a lot of good times and bad. We had fought some of the same battles, and I so much wanted to see her before she died. But at the same time that all this was going on, there were 13 members of Doug's family at my house expecting Christmas Eve dinner. I know you've all had overload times like this before, and we managed to get through them without any scars, basically through the grace of God. I was worried about my dad, and I was grieving for my friend, who I would probably never see again. But somehow, in the quiet of Christmas Eve, through the tears and the worry, through the grief, the stress, and the prayers, God came into my life and brought me peace. I felt a calming presence and a transforming moment. It was as if I could see Wiley in her bed in Atlanta at the hospice where she had gone to die. I imagined the setting, not in a hospital room with bright lights and equipment, but like a room in someone's home, warm and welcoming. The light was dim and Wiley was comfortable, not in pain. There were Christmas decorations, lots of cards, and a friend was sitting by, close by reading. Wiley wasn't alone, which had been her greatest fear. And she wasn't in pain, which had been my greatest fear for her. God's presence filled the room, yet somehow I was able to feel it, hundreds of miles away. I won't say that I had a vision, for modern, educated people don't say things like that. But I will say that God transformed that moment into something extraordinary that brought me astonishing comfort and peace. It was an incredible gift and one that I will never forget. Wiley, as many of you know, died in the morning of December the 31st at the age of 55 after her fourth occurrence of cancer. I was told that friends were beside her bed day and night and that she was never alone. Experiences such as this are the stuff that faith is made of. We can analyze and explain them away if we want to, or we can take them as the gift they are meant to be through the empowering presence of God's Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ, through his life and death, has transformed our lives. No longer do sin and death have the last word, but we have the promise of eternal life and a new beginning. One of the most assuring signs of God's love for us is how God works in the lives of ordinary people like me and you and these new officers that will be ordained and installed today. He calls us and he charges us to do his work and his will. He calls us to a greater awareness of his presence and empowerment that we might serve him and be assigned to others of his transforming power. He equips us and calls us to a deeper faith that we might point others to him that they too might experience his glory. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Please remain standing as we affirm our faith together using the historic words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us affirm what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Indeed, God's giving knows no ending. As we just sang our prayer, open wide our hands in sharing. As we present to God our morning tithes and offerings, and as this morning we collect our pennies for hunger.
Gracious God, your great generosity and many blessings toward us are indeed a wonder, a sign of your amazing grace. May these gifts be a sign of our faith and generosity and a commitment to serve others. In Christ's name, amen. Please be seated. At this time, we will proceed with the ordination and installation of officers who have, are about to begin a three-year term of service as elder or deacon. If they would come forward, come to the front of the church and stand here in the front of the church as their names are called. And if Judy Rogers, uh, the new clerk of session, would also come forward because she will have a question for the congregation in just a moment. We have basically three categories. We have some elders who have been ordained previously and now will need to be installed. We have persons to be ordained as elders. This will be their first time of being an elder. And then those to be ordained as deacon. All of our new deacons uh, need to be ordained. None of these are uh, persons who've been ordained as deacons before. But if they would come up as I call their name. Richard Boyette. Rob Fields and Francis McLean. These are elders that need to be installed. Persons to be ordained as elders, Gordon Brown. Carol Burgess. Connie Grant. Jennifer Ingram, Dick Morey, and Duncan Ray. And then persons to be ordained as deacon, and for symmetry's sake, I guess we'll have you line this way, Mark Brown, Ben Butler, Amy Carmack, Laurie Dennison, Becky Glendie. Amy Gray, Urbana Gupton, Lisa Ham, Reese Hester. Greg Martin, Alice Moore, and Yancey Newell. Whether you have been ordained or installed to this office before, the questions are the same. And so I will have a series of questions for all of you together, and then there will be one question specifically for elders, and then one question specifically for deacons. And then following that, I will invite those of you who need to be ordained to um, crowd here in the middle and ask you to kneel for the service of laying on of hands. But first, the questions. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge Him Lord of all and Head of the Church, and through Him do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you? Do you accept the Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the Church Universal and God's Word to you? Do you? 
Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church, as authentic and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you and will you? Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? And will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? And now for the elders. Will you be a faithful elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? And will you share in government and discipline, serving in governing bodies of the church? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? And for deacons. Will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? We have a question for the congregation. Do we, the members of this church, accept these persons as elder and deacon, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation, to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? And do we agree to encourage them, to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of this church? If you do, please say, we do. And now if the elders to be ordained would come toward the middle and all the deacons come this way, we're going to come together and then ask you to kneel. And at this time... uh, All uh, elders in the church and any ministers of word and sacrament are invited to come forward for the service of laying on of hands. If you'll just kneel. No, you're fine. Let us pray. Lord God of grace, almost as soon as you began gathering a people, you called forth leaders to serve you and to guide your people, to provide faithful leadership, servant leadership. But it is in Jesus Christ that we completely understand what it is to be a leader in your kingdom. Help us live our lives after the manner of Jesus Christ in all that we do as we submit our will to your will, as we yield our hopes and dreams to your plans and purposes. Lord God, as we set aside these officers this day, we set them aside not for glory or for recognition. We set them aside for service. You have already given them a number of gifts. Some they've discovered, some as yet undiscovered. As they serve you, O God, reveal those gifts to them and use those gifts in a mighty way that in all things you might be glorified in and through their work and in and through our life together. Pour out your blessing upon each one. 
Give them each the gifts of your Holy Spirit that they might be made strong for this journey and live their lives for your glory now and forevermore. Amen. You may stand, or you can if you may. That's, or you, there you go. Sometimes that's easier said than done. You are now ordained and installed as officers, elders, and deacons in this particular Presbyterian Church and for the Presbyterian Church USA. Let all that you do as officers in the church and let all that you do as people of faith be done to the glory of God and for the sake of Jesus Christ. For it is to His glory and honor that we work and serve. Go in peace. Go forth as God's chosen people to love and serve the Lord. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit go with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.